It's been said that there's a fine line between genius and insanity, and this next story probably illustrates that better than most. Now this episode is going to be a little bit longer than what I usually post up there, so I hope that you'll bear with me on this. It's a story that's been told many times before, but there's always a lot of nuance and details that are left out of it, which I think rounds it out. And I hope in this episode that I manage to do that. Because the main character is someone that has been forgotten over time. And in fact, NASA pretty much disavows his very existence and contributions to the space program. But his story is absolutely, well, you know, it's extremely strange. Whiteside Jack Parsons was born on October 2nd, 1914 at Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles to Ruth Virginia Whiteside and Marvell H. Parsons, who had moved to California from Massachusetts a year prior to his birth. Unfortunately, Marvell and Ruth's marriage dissolved a year after Jack's birth when she discovered Marvell had been visiting a prostitute both before and after he was born. Being denied any contact with his son, his father returned to Massachusetts, where he enlisted in the military, achieving the rank of major, and he also remarried. His maternal grandparents, Carrie and Walter Whiteside, moved to California to be with their daughter and grandson, and purchased an upscale home in Pasadena in an affluent area still known as Millionaire's Row. As a result of his grandparents' wealth, Jack enjoyed a life of privilege, though he had few friends save for the domestic help employed at the home. As a boy, he took great interest in some of the classic works of mythology like the Arthurian legend and Arabian Nights. A fan of the works of Jules Verne, he also became interested in science fiction and pulp magazines such as Amazing Stories, and as a result developed a fascination with rocketry. For all his intellect, Jack was not a very good or very popular student. He was bullied partially for his elite status, but also because his manner was considered somewhat effeminate, and it's been surmised he may have been dyslexic. He did form one close friendship with another young boy named Edward Foreman, who was from a working-class family and would stick up for Jack against his tormentors. Edward also had a keen interest in sci-fi and rocketry. By the ages of 14, the boys began to conduct rocket experiments using gunpowder in the Arroyo Seco Canyon and sometimes in the family backyard, creating craters in the ground that marked the launches. Eventually, these experiments progressed to more advanced stages. It was around this time that Parsons began to develop an interest in occultism, and at one point conducted a ritual designed to summon Satan himself to his bedroom. Alarmed that he might be successful, for a time he discontinued this practice. Failing to achieve passing grades in high school, he was sent off to the Brown Military Academy for Boys in San Diego where he was summarily expelled for blowing up toilets in the boys' room. After a brief family visit to Europe, they returned to Pasadena where the Great Depression took its toll on the family's wealth, and soon after, Jack's grandfather Walter passed away. Eventually, Jack went off to study at a private college, the university school, and their liberal approach to education resonated with him. Teachers who had studied at nearby Caltech motivated in him an interest in chemistry. Taking on a job to help the family financially, he found work at the Hercules Powder Company, where he learned more about explosives and their role in rocket propulsion. Over time, he designed and constructed a solid-fuel rocket engine 
While his friend Foreman made valuable connections with leading propulsion engineers like Robert Goddard and Werner von Braun, Parsons himself would spend countless hours on the phone with von Braun. Upon his graduation from university school in 1933, he moved in with his mother and grandmother and enrolled at Pasadena Junior College. But due to the family's struggles, he soon left and returned to work at Hercules Powder Company, where he was assigned to their manufacturing plant. He hoped to earn enough money to attend Stanford University, but all that resulted from that were headaches resulting from prolonged exposure to nitroglycerin. Still attempting to find a way to attend Caltech, he and Foreman made the acquaintance of a young mathematician and mechanical engineer named Frank Molina, and the three became fast friends. They all applied to Caltech, and after an initial denial, were accepted as an advisor of Molina's saw promise in their pursuits. They were assigned to the college's prestigious Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory, where they set to work on rocket development, with Molina and Foreman providing most of the calculations and design elements, and Parsons contributing his vast imagination. In 1934, Parsons also developed another interest, and her name was Helen Northrup, who he met at a church dance. He soon proposed, and they were married a year later. They moved to Pasadena, where he found work at the Halifax Powder Company. Helen soon found out she was in for more than she bargained for, as what little money they made was spent manufacturing nitroglycerin in their home, and a laboratory was constructed on their porch. Needing more funding, Parsons pawned Helen's engagement ring and solicited her parents for money. Eager to launch test rockets, Molina was invited to Robert Goddard's lab in Roswell, New Mexico, but he found the brilliant engineer hesitant to share much of his research. They were soon joined in their pursuit by a host of Caltech graduate students, six of them in all. Their first liquid fuel engine test was conducted near Devil's Gate Dam on Halloween night of 1936. The first attempts were unsuccessful as three of them resulted in the rocket misfiring and the fourth almost setting them all on fire. But they persevered and in January of 1937, they conducted a successful launch. Impressed, the university allowed them to conduct future experiments at their campus rocket testing facility. More interested parties joined, a donation from an anonymous benefactor was secured, and the group would become known as the Suicide Squad, which was both cool and appropriate for their dangerous line of work. The crew then became something of local celebrities, with Parsons enlisted by the Los Angeles Police Department as an explosive expert in their investigation of a car bomb which nearly took the life of Harry Raymond, a former LAPD detective turned private investigator who became a whistleblower against corruption in the police force. Police Captain Earl Kynette was convicted based in large part on Parsons' testimony. Parsons also became something of a darling of the lecture circuit, making the acquaintance of people like Forrest Ackerman and a young sci-fi writer named Ray Bradbury. Things took a much different turn when Sidney Weinbaum joined the project. He was a Jewish refugee from Western Russia who was very interested in Marxism. He led some of the group in establishing a secret communist group within Caltech, known as Professional Unit 122 of the Pasadena Communist Party. Parsons would eventually reject the ideology of the group ending his relationship with Weinbaum. It was in early 1939 when friends of Jack and Helen Parsons, John and Francis Baxter, encouraged them to join them at the Church of Thelema in Hollywood to attend the Gnostic Mass, which was conceived of and written by none other than notorious English occultist Aleister Crowley. Celebrities like actor John Carradine and gay activist Harry Hay were also in attendance, and Parsons was intrigued by Crowley, of whom he was already aware of through his own readings. Parsons came to believe that Thelemic magic could be connected to quantum physics, and began to recruit friends to attend masses. 
While some remained uninspired by the performances, others, including his sister-in-law Sarah, became equally intrigued. He and Helen were accepted into the Agape Lodge, which was the next iteration of the Church of Thelema in 1941. Parsons received a glowing recommendation to Crowley from Wilfred Talbot Smith, a high-ranking officer of the church and a noted occultist and ceremonial magician. Crowley agreed with him, telling Smith that Parsons, quote, is the most valued member of the whole order, with no exception. Meanwhile, back at the launching pad, Molina requested funding from the National Academy of Sciences for further research into jet propulsion, which by now had piqued the interest of the military. As a result, the group became the first of its type to receive government sanctioning. They received $1,000 with another $10,000 granted to Caltech from the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, largely based on a paper detailing their progress that was submitted to them by Parsons. 25% of that amount, however, was earmarked to repair damages to buildings caused by their experiments. And because of continuing complaints from other scientists on campus, they took their experiments back to Arroyo Seco, building essentially metal sheds which doubled as laboratories and offices. Their work wasn't unnoticed by science giant Popular Mechanics, which in 1940 featured an interview with Parsons and Molina speaking of sending a rocket outside of the Earth's atmosphere into orbit and possibly someday reaching the moon. They were assigned 18 assistants that were supplied by the WPA, and at this point the FBI became involved, vetting all who would work in close proximity to the project. Their rumored Marxist ties to Weinbaum were looked into, but not deemed to be a security threat. As the United States had entered into World War II, their success became increasingly crucial to the war effort. They also realized that failure could result in their being drafted into the military, which was totally contradictory to their more liberal views. It was then that a combination of gasoline combined with red fuming nitric acid, which was substituted for liquid oxygen, proved successful. Albeit only after another rocket engine exploded, essentially destroying the adjacent structures, but leaving the testers unharmed. On August 12, 1941, America's first rocket-assisted fixed-wing aircraft was tested and was immediately a huge hit. The group agreed to provide 60 engines to the U.S. Army Air Corps, and so the Aerojet Engineering Corps was formed. To get to their real destination, outer space, they'd have to prove their value to the military first. Still tinkering with malfunctions, Parsons created a thermoplastic casing made of liquid asphalt that was durable no matter the climate. Versions of this idea were later used by NASA in space shuttle rocket boosters, as well as Polaris, Poseidon, and Minuteman missiles. While his newfound fame brought him into the public eye more and more, his personal life was taking a much darker turn. He formed alliances with more members and associates of Aleister Crowley and the Thelemic Society, including writers of science fiction novels like Jack Williamson and Anthony Boucher. On the home front, Ellen left for a time in June of 1941, where Parsons was empowered by the sexually open teachings of the Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO, to begin a sexual relationship with his 17-year-old sister-in-law, Sarah. When Helen returned home, she was informed by her sister that she was now Jack's wife, and by her husband that he found Sarah much more physically attractive. Helen sought the counsel of Wilfred Talbot Smith, and eventually struck up a relationship with him. Both couples would then live under the same roof communally with other Thelemites and their families in a mansion in Pasadena. There they began a life of self-sustenance, slaughtering animals for food and taking part in the occasional blood ritual. The garage was converted into a laboratory, science fiction discussions were always a hot topic in the kitchen, and fairy hunts in the gardens were conducted for the children. 
The lion's share of Jack's salary was given to the OTO, and he was constantly recruiting new members. As a result of his debauchery and his oddball interest, his work at his actual job began to suffer, and whispers of his dalliances with the occult began to circulate. To no one's surprise, the Agape Lodge came under scrutiny by the Pasadena police, as well as the FBI, in response to allegations of the existence of a black magic cult, sexual orgies, and a complaint by a 16-year-old boy of being raped there, along with the report of a naked pregnant woman seen jumping through a fire. Parsons talked their way out of it by claiming they were an organization, quote, dedicated to religious and philosophical speculation. This seemed to satisfy all concerned parties, and no charges of illegal activity against them were brought. Jack, meanwhile, was still indulging in alcohol and marijuana, but had graduated to cocaine, amphetamines, opiates, mescaline, and peyote, as well as promiscuous sex with multiple partners, including that of a close friend whom he paid to have an abortion. There was also a power struggle developing within the Agape Lodge, as Crowley wanted Smith removed as its head, with the concern he was being a bad influence. Parsons and his ex-wife Helen protested, but were told to hold their tongues. Parsons was then named head of the lodge, an appointment that didn't sit well with some members who resented his sexual promiscuousness and overall nihilistic attitude. Crowley also had his reservations, especially with Parsons' public orations regarding his drug use. Helen would go on to bear Smith's child, a son they named Quen Lonval Parsons. Crowley, meanwhile, conducted an astrological analysis of Smith's birth chart and came to the conclusion he was the manifestation of a god, which pretty much took Smith off his shit list. But while he and Helen were on retreat, he encouraged them to basically stay away, which encouraged Smith to resign from the OTO. Loyal to Smith, Parsons also chose to resign but a letter from Crowley persuaded him to reevaluate his choice. By now, the Germans had developed the V-2 rocket, and a sense of urgency overcame what little patience remained with the group's research. Three million dollars more was granted, and the group was renamed the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, now under the orders to produce 20,000 jet engines per month. 51% of its stock was negotiated to be sold to General Tire and Rubber Company to ease the increased demand financially, but only on the condition Parsons and Foreman be removed. Their occult beliefs and ideologies had now come full cycle against them, as well as Parsons' proclivity for recklessness. He was paid $11,000 for his share. Now on their own, Parsons and Foreman founded Ad Astra Engineering Company, which soon was the subject of an FBI investigation into espionage after agents from the Manhattan Project found Ad Astra had somehow come into possession of a top-secret chemical. They were eventually determined to be innocent of wrongdoing. Parsons also ran afoul of Crowley when he welcomed Smith and Helen back into his new home even though he had petitioned for a divorce from her. He also began to rent rooms to non-Thelemites of a more bohemian nature, artists, musicians, anarchists, atheists, and so forth. One of them was a science fiction writer and U.S. Navy officer named L. Ron Hubbard, and he and Parsons struck up a quick friendship. Hubbard was given a strong recommendation to Crowley by Parsons, stating that while he was not a practitioner of magic, he had a strong understanding of it, was very thelemic, and was likely in contact with some higher force. Because the OTO encouraged open relationships, Helen soon became smitten with Hubbard, which made Parsons extremely jealous. Turning to black magic, he sought to conjure himself another female companion, much to the displeasure of other OTO members. One of them, Jane Wolfe, wrote directly to Crowley expressing her and the other's concerns. Among other things, his attempts to imbue statues around the house with magic energy to make them easy to sell to other occultists. Soon, Parsons began to report paranormal activity within the house. Poltergeists, apparitions, disembodied voices, 
and ghostly orbs were among those reports. Apparently, one ritual resulted in the appearance of a screaming banshee outside the window, which was said to affect Foreman for the remainder of his life. Parsons, meanwhile, went into a rabbit hole he would never return from. In December of 1945, he embarked on a series of rituals contained in the Book of Enoch, an occult work written in the 16th century, one of which required him to pleasure himself onto various magic tablets, which was to result in the summoning of the Lemite goddess Babylon to Earth. Hubbard was invited to document this exercise in insanity. One final ritual took place in the Mojave Desert in February of 1946. A woman named Marjorie Cameron, a former Navy wave and currently an unemployed illustrator, came to the house for a visit. Parsons believed she was the physical manifestation of Babylon he had previously summoned and thus began a series of sex rituals with her, with Hubbard documenting the activities. Cameron, initially not knowing what the hell was going on, unlike the rest of the occupants of the house, was skeptical of the whole thing, but one day told Parsons of her sighting of a UFO, which he immediately interpreted as the impending coming of Babylon. Inspired by a work by Crowley titled Moonchild, Parsons and Hubbard set about attempting an immaculate conception where a child would be born by a woman without human fertilization. The child would become a Thelemic Messiah representing Babylon. When Cameron left on a trip to New York, Parsons returned to the desert where he claimed a divine power via automatic writing provided him with Liber 49, which was the fourth part of Crowley's sacred text of Thelema called the Book of the Law. Believing his work was done, he sold his home to developers for $25,000 under the condition he and Cameron continue to live there, and he named another man, Roy Leffingwell, to head up the Agape Lodge, albeit on a different property. He, Hubbard, and Sarah then formed a company called Allied Enterprises, with Hubbard suggesting they purchase three yachts in Miami and sail them through the Panama Canal back to the West Coast where they could sell them for profit. As this was not the craziest idea they ever had, Parsons agreed, against the warnings of many friends. Unbeknownst to Parsons, Hubbard had requested permission from the U.S. Navy to sail to China and South America under the guise of collecting writing material, all the while planning to embark on a world cruise. Realizing his friend may have pulled a fast one on him after Hubbard and Sarah left for Florida with $10,000 of the money, Parsons was beside himself. A phone call from Hubbard assured him there was nothing to worry about, and Parsons took him at his word, but he soon came to realize he had been conned by Hubbard and Sarah. Flying to Miami armed with an injunction and a restraining order, Parsons confronted them at a harbor in County Causeway. Indeed, they had purchased three yachts, and actually tried to escape on one, but a sudden storm hit and they were forced to return to port. For his part, Parsons was convinced that a ceremony he had conducted earlier via a banishing ritual using a pentagram, invoking the vengeful spirit of Mars, Bartzabel, had forced them to shore. In any event, an agreement was reached and Hubbard would pay Parsons what he owed him, and Parsons, for his part, agreed not to pursue any further actions against them, lest Sarah report him for statutory rape, as she was under 18 when they had their first sexual encounter. Taking advantage of that sordid form of blackmail, Parsons was paid only $2,900, and Hubbard, who was already married to a woman named Margaret Grubb, then committed bigamy and married Sarah. He would go on to found Dianetics and Scientology, which is another weird story in itself. When Parsons went public in 1969 about the whole affair and revealed Hubbard's connection with the OTO, the Church of Scientology published a statement that Hubbard had actually been an undercover operative sent by the U.S. Navy to tear down Parsons' black magic cult. Parsons would then sell his home and in a letter to Alistair Crowley, resigned from the OTO, condemning it as an autocratic operation. 
Parsons would then go on to work on the Navajo Missile Program as he and Cameron moved into a home on Manhattan Beach where he continued to instruct her in occultism. When she fell victim to seizures, Parsons claimed she could deal with them through astral projection. At that time, he continued to lecture on man eventually being able to rocket to the moon and maintain correspondence with Crowley until Crowley's death in 1947. As the Cold War emerged and the House Un-American Activities Committee was formed to weed out communist sympathizers, Parsons and many of his colleagues weren't spared, as they were stripped of security clearances because of their subversive characterizations. While he felt his association with Thelemism was at the root of his banishment, the FBI were actually more interested in his association with Marxists at Caltech, and Foreman and Molina's clearances were revoked as well. From there, Parsons flunked out of USC for non-attendance and found employment by bootlegging nitroglycerin, working at a gas station, and as a hospital orderly. His marriage to Cameron was failing, so she moved to Mexico to live in an artist's community. At his wit's end, and not having a career in science nor friends, he again turned to occultism, conducting sexually based rituals with prostitutes, all the while attempting to gain some form of universal consciousness. He claims this resulted in an out-of-body experience where he was transported to the biblical city of Chorazin. He also pled allegiance to the Antichrist, who in Crowley's writings, quote, who am come to fulfill the law of the beast 666. And also he wrote an occult text entitled The Book of the Antichrist, believing Babylon would come to earth and supersede all other organized religions. During this time he disclosed Hubbard had written him offering Sarah back, and he moved into a house in Redondo Beach with a new paramour named Gladys Gohan. This didn't make Marjorie happy when she returned from Mexico, so she immediately returned there with Parsons filing divorce papers citing extreme cruelty on her part. Parsons eventually had his security clearance reinstated after he testified before a closed federal court that Thelemism was anti-fascist as well as anti-communist, instead encouraging individualism. There was no evidence he was in some way a communist sympathizer. He then went on to design and construct a chemical plant for Hughes Aircraft Company, but as usual, he would sustain another self-inflicted wound. Herbert Rosenfeld of the American Technion Society, which supported the newly created State of Israel, offered him a job in the Israeli rocket program, which he accepted. But as the Red Scare in the United States intensified, he left for Israel, but a secretary at Hughes Aircraft who had typed up a portfolio for him for the Technion Society turned him into the FBI on the charge of stealing classified company documents that he wanted included in the portfolio. He was then fired from Hughes Aircraft and was under the suspicion of being a spy for the Israeli government. He denied the charges and received some support from the scientific community but it would be touch and go when Rosenfeld was linked to Soviet agents and more of his occult activities came to light. Nonetheless, the contents of the report did not prove guilt of espionage and Parsons dodged another bullet. This time though, his security clearances were revoked permanently, which effectively ended his career in rocketry. He then founded Parsons Chemical Company in North Hollywood and created pyrotechnics and various other effects for the film industry. Marjorie Cameron would return to him and they moved back to Pasadena where he built a home laboratory. The new house was the scene of raucous parties that often drew the attention of the police. A new Thelemite group called the Witchcraft was founded and classes were offered for a $10 fee. A book of poems called Songs for the Witch Woman was written by him illustrated by Cameron, and published in 2014. The couple decided to travel to Mexico, where Parsons sought to open an explosives factory for the government there. From that point, he hoped to relocate to Israel, where he would be free to resume his development of rockets without the prying eyes of United States federal authorities. The day before they were to depart, June 17, 1952, 
Parsons was rushing to fill an order for explosives for a movie set. When an explosion destroyed much of the building he was working in and mortally wounded him, he was rushed to Huntington Memorial Hospital, where he was declared dead within an hour after the fatal explosion occurred. Upon hearing of his death, his mother Ruth took a fatal dose of barbiturates. While investigators, with the expert aid of his friend Edward Foreman, concluded that most likely a mixture of volatile chemicals inside a coffee can was dropped, igniting the blast, others familiar with Parsons' work cast some doubt on that conclusion, citing his cautiousness in handling explosive materials, something he had never been accused of previously. But reason won out as the amount of dangerous chemicals stored at the house as well as the presence of a syringe filled with morphine found at the scene, resulted in the case being labeled an accidental death. Jane Wolfe and Wilfred Talbot Smith had a different take, not surprisingly, one that took more of a conspiratorial angle. They claimed it was likely a suicide stemming from depression. While others suspected Howard Hughes was behind it all, in retribution for the theft of proprietary research documents. For her part, Marjorie Cameron also suspected murder, but her suspects were the police department, who sought vengeance for his help in convicting Earl Kennett, or anti-Zionists who opposed his work for the State of Israel. A friend of Cameron's, artist Renate Drucks, expressed her belief that Parsons likely took his own life in a ritual designed to create a homunculus, or tiny artificial being. A private service was conducted at the Parsons' home, after which Marjorie scattered his ashes in the Mojave Desert. Most of his possessions were burned. Marjorie later attempted to contact him via astral projection, but how that turned out is unknown. The OTO also held a separate service for him, attended by both Helen and Sarah, in which Wilfred Talbot Smith led them in the Gnostic Mass.